This morning, as it's Memorial Day weekend, I thought it would be appropriate for us to spend some time on the theme of remembrance. And so to that end, I elected for us to spend our time this morning in Psalm 78, which has as its theme, the theme of remembrance. Now, Psalm 78 is a little bit of a longer psalm, and that's okay, because it has, as I just mentioned, a very straightforward theme. And the theme is to always remember and never forget, and always remember and never forget specifically what the Lord has done and what he has done for his people. And so as we come into the psalm, I I think it's good for us to have a couple of heads up, specifically to to help us read the psalm better as we go through it. And so the first thing that I want to give a heads up on is the theme of the psalm. Again, it's always remember and never forget. You're going to hear this again and again and again, particularly in the first eight verses, which give us sort of introduction into the psalm. And then to help us accomplish that, and this is another thing that we need to have a heads up on, to accomplish this, Asaph, the author of the psalm, divides the psalm really into two parts. And he gives two recitations of Israel's history, one which begins in verse 9 and ends in verse 39, one which begins in verse 40 and ends in verse 72. And the first of these recitations really goes over the history of Israel, beginning with the crossing of the Red Sea, and then focusing specifically on the wanderings in the wilderness. The second recitation, which begins in verse 40, starts even farther back with the plagues and ends even farther forward with David being set on the throne and Asaph bringing that forward all the way to the present, at least as far as he was concerned. And so with that framework in mind, I wanted us to turn to Psalm 78. But before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, we pray that as the word would have us to remember and to never forget what it is that you have done for your people and in your people, we ask that we would always remember and never forget and that you would use this time in your word as an opportunity to teach us and to place upon our hearts and in our minds the truth uh, specifically about Christ of what he has done for us and how it is that we are to live in light of what he has done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 78, we'll start in the first verse and we'll run through to the final verse. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, And they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the region of Zon. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag. He made waters flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him. Rebelling in the desert against the Most High, they willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out, and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel. For they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. 
Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heaven. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and led forth the south wind by his power. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp, all around their tents. They ate till they had more than enough, for he had given them what they craved. But before they turned from the food they craved, even while it was still in their mouths, God's anger rose against them. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of all his wonders, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility and their years in terror. Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God Most High was their Redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel They did not remember his power the day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zon. He turned their rivers to blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave them over, he gave over their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the desert. He guided them safely, so they were unafraid. But the sea engulfed their enemies. Thus he brought them to the border of his holy land, to the hill country his right hand had taken. He drove out nations before them and allotted their lands to them as an inheritance. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes. But they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes. Like their fathers, they were faithless, disloyal, and as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among men. He sent the ark of his might into captivity his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was very angry with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men, and their maidens had no wedding songs. Their priests were put to the sword, and their widows could not weep. When the Lord then awoke as from sleep, as a man wakes from the stupor of wine, he beat back his enemies. He put them to everlasting shame. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. We discussed at our small group last night the 
the truth that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Sometimes I might say it like this. There are two kinds of people. There are those who will remember history, and there are those who will repeat history. History. And that's what we see here in the, opening, in the opening part of the psalm, verses 1 to 8. Asaph is concerned that the people will not forget and that they will remember and that they will teach subsequent generations what God has done. And to do that, he takes on, in these first eight verses, he takes on his pen, the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 7, we read this. Hear, O Israel, very, very well-known verses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. The Israelites had a God-given mission to remember what God had done for them in the Exodus and then to tell future generations how it is that they inherited a legacy that was to be remembered and celebrated and of what God had done for them. And the Israelites were given this God-given mission of remembering what God had done to save them out of Egypt, the manna he had fed them with, the parting of the Red Sea, the water from the rock, the quail from heaven, the defeat of their enemies, and all the victories that they would have. They were to remember all of these things for the purpose of not forgetting God, that they might not sin against God. The more they remembered, the less that they would sin and rebel against God. That was the, that was the desire of Asaph's heart. And so the psalmist does not want them to fail in their duty. And so we see this in verses 7 and 8. And in verses 7 and 8, he lays out positively what good will happen if they remember. And in the negative, he tells them the bad that will not happen if they remember. You start with the positive, then in verse 7. If they remember, if they teach their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. That's the positive. Now the negative to be avoided in verse 8. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. So that's the introduction. That's what Asaph wants. Asaph wants the people to remember so they would honor the Lord and future generations would do the same. And he wants them to remember that they wouldn't repeat the mistakes of past generations, that past generations who were rebellious, who were hard-hearted, who who forsook the Lord. He doesn't want that to happen again. He wants that cycle to end and to end in his generation. So remember and don't forget. And again, to help this, to help help this message come through to help make his point, he goes back in time and he gives these two recitations which remind the present generation of how past generations had failed. And this first recitation again begins in verse 9. And here he goes back to the Exodus. The Exodus is God's biggest Old Testament scene. In fact, if, if you were to look through the Bible carefully, you would notice that almost every book and oftentimes almost every chapter has some kind of reference back to God's activity, his saving activity in the Exodus. And Jesus defines his own salvific power, his own identity as a savior, oftentimes, as we'll see in a little bit, in terms of the Exodus, in terms of what God had done for his people all the way back in the time of Moses. And so the author, uh, the author Asaph, dives back into this time and he begins then and he says, and this is just uh, parts of different verses, they forgot what he had done. The Israelites and their wilderness wanderings and the rebellion, they forgot what he had done. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. Now this refers to the crossing of the Red Sea. The Israelites had the Red Sea on one side and they had Pharaoh's army on the other and they seemed like they were going to be destroyed by one side or the other. But 
Of course, we might say that God was on their side. God parts the sea. They walk through the sea on dry ground, and he rescues them out of Egypt. This was to be something that was to be celebrated. And then the Lord, as the, as the author, as Asaph recounts, the Lord was with them. He guarded them and he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when they were hungry, he gave them manna. And when they were thirsty, he gave them water. And when they wanted meat, he gave them quail. And all along the way, God always provided. And it seems as though every time God provided, they found a reason to grumble. And they find a reason to grumble. They come out and they're hungry and they, they don't trust that the God who parted the sea and did all the other stuff, that they, they didn't trust that he could feed them as well. Can, can, he, can he lay a banquet on the floor of the wilderness, on the ground in the desert? So they begin to grumble against Moses and they say, essentially, it would have been better for us to be back in Egypt where there were meat pots and we could sit around them and eat. Now, of course, they forget that when they were back in Egypt, they had groaned out to the Lord for a Savior, and the Lord had sent them exactly what they had asked for. And now that they've received what they've asked for, they are incredibly ungrateful and incredibly faithless to have seen something with their own eyes and now to doubt that very same God. But as they grumble, God gives them what they want. As verse 19 says, he did spread a table in the desert. They ate Ate the food of angels. Uh, it's just such a magnificent uh, play on words. They ate the food of angels and they all took it for granted. They grumbled again about the water and, and Moses is able by God's power to turn the bitter death water into sweet life-giving water. And then they want meat and so the Lord sends quail among them so they can eat all the meat they want. But again, they grumbled again and again and again. They put the Lord to the test again and again and again. And God had mercy on them so often. But in time, they pushed it to the point where God would not have mercy on them. And we see this in Numbers 11. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. And Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. You know, at times the earth opened to swallow up those who rebelled against Moses, but the people just kept falling into the exact same pattern. And this pattern is expressed in verses 35 to 37. Verses 35 to 37, I'll read those again. They remembered that God was their rock. That's after God slew them. They remembered that God was their rock, that God Most High was their Redeemer. But then they would flatter Him with their mouths, lying to Him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to Him. They were not faithful to His Covenant. You see this cycle again and again, not just in the Exodus, but in other times as well. There's, there's God shows grace. That, of all things, that's what the Exodus is. It's an act of grace. And then they respond with a sort of immediate thankfulness and obedience. But then over time, they forget. And in their forgetfulness, then they begin to rebel. So then the Lord allows judgment to come upon them. And when the judgment comes upon them, they suffer. And when they suffer, they cry out to the Lord. And then the Lord has grace. And then they forget. And then they rebel. And you go on and on and on. Sort of a rinse and repeat situation. And again, it's not just the Exodus. You can read perhaps the perfect example of this in the story of Judges, but then there's plenty of this to come as well as we'll remember in just a moment in the book of Kings. But the Lord never gave them entirely what they deserved. They deserved to be crushed, to be obliterated, annihilated, whatever. They deserved to be entirely forsaken, but he didn't. We see this in verse 38. Yet he was merciful he forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. 
They forgot again and again and again and again and again and again and again the Lord was merciful and restrained his anger and did not pour out his full wrath. Did he swallow some up? Yes, he did. Did he send down fire and consume some? Yes, he did. But he didn't consume them all. He didn't swallow them all, even though they had all rebelled. And so through all this ugliness, God was still Merciful. That's the end of the first recitation. It's not a very flattering story, not a very flattering account, is it? Well, the next recitation isn't really any better, though it does end on a high note. You come into the next one, starting as you come out of verse 39 into verse 40, and he kind of transitions softly. He remembers again, repeats again this wilderness problem, but then he goes back farther than that. And starting in verse 42, he reminds the people of Israel of what previous generations had forgotten. And he goes back to the time of the plagues when Moses comes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. And he says, no. And he says, no. And he says, no. And he says, no. And then the the author, Asaph, he goes through and he recalls these plagues. He, He reminds them of the plague of the water into blood, the Nile River being turned to blood, and the plague of the flies, and the plague of the frogs, and the locusts, and the hail. And then he comes finally to the plague of death. And he spends a bit more time on this, and he, he speaks of it in, again in vivid language in verse 49. He unleashed, God unleashed against Egypt his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt. You see the the contrast with the words angels. The Israelites ate the bread of angels in the wilderness and the destroying angels came upon the Egyptians as God was liberating his people from the land of Egypt. And then Asaph remembers once more the splitting of the Red Sea. But whereas he had left off before this part of the story, he reminds the people that while Israel passed through on dry ground, Pharaoh's army was drowned in the sea. But this is where the second version really departs from the first, is he skips all the way forward now until when the Israelites found themselves entering into the land of Canaan. He skips past all the wanderings. He goes to the land of Canaan. He reminds the Israelites how God had taken little Israel, these former slaves who didn't have iron weapons, didn't have cities. All they were was was wandering nomads. And he took this unlikely, seemingly helpless people. And before them, he drives out all of his enemies. He causes big city walls like Jericho to crumble. He makes the people tremble before them. At the at the head of the army Joshua is there and everyone flees before him he wins all of his battles the Lord is their savior as the word as the name Joshua means and he has given them this great victory after victory after victory and then what happens but they forget the Israelites put up idols just like the nations had their idols they worshiped what they shouldn't worship And they worshipped where they shouldn't worship. And so God abandons them. He even allows the Ark of the Covenant, which was the sign of his presence, he allows the Ark of the Covenant to be carried off into exile. To be carried off as a, a treasure, a spoil of war. And he seems to have just abandoned his people. And they lose, and they lose battles, and they end up hiding in caves and they're always running and cowering before their enemies, enemies like the Philistines. But then again, he has mercy on them. Asaph uses what we might call an an anthropomorphism. He ascribes to God human characteristics. He says that, that God woke up as though he had been sleeping, or perhaps he came to his senses as as a man who was drunk comes to his own senses, of course God doesn't sleep and God certainly 
doesn't get drunk, but you get the idea. He, he takes a special notice and he begins to win victories for his people again. Do they deserve this? Not by any means they deserve, but God has mercy and he has grace upon them again. And then finally, the psalm ends on this, on this high note. David, this shepherd, this shepherd of, of a small family in a small, a small clan in the tribe of Judah, David is taken out of the sheep fields and placed on the throne in Jerusalem where God begins to dwell with his people again. And he's a good king. As you come to the end of the psalm, Asaph describes him this way, David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. The psalm ends on this, on this high note, and that's a good thing. We like happy endings. We, we like when things end on, on a good note. But we know that whereas the present comes for Asaph and things seem to be going quite well, it doesn't stay that way, and the story continues to repeat itself. David dies, and he isn't always a man of integrity, though still a man after God's own heart. But David dies, and then the the kingdom of Israel and Judah split, and they kind of have their own ups and downs. They have their own patterns. A couple of bad kings and great rebellion, and then a good king comes. The people cry out to the Lord, and then more bad kings, and then a good king, until finally the Lord has had enough. And he sends them off into exile, and there they are in exile for 70 years because they had forgotten the Lord. And then they cry out, and the Lord brings them out of exile back to Israel, and things seem like they're going to go well. But the Old Testament ends not on a very happy note. When the Old Testament ends, the people are back in Israel, but they have no king, they have no temple, Jerusalem is not a great city, and they have no nation. It's a mediocre ending at best, all because they had forgotten the Lord again and again and again. It's good for us to remember and to take to heart the message of this psalm. Remembrance of what God has done, remembrance of God's character, prevents us from committing the same sins and rebellions which the Israelites had committed so many times. And we can fall into these same traps and fall into them very easily. Asaph said of the Israelites, then they would flatter him with their mouths. This is when they had needs. And they would flatter him with their mouths, but lie to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. Oh, they would find themselves in trouble and they would recognize that they had a need. And so then they would cry out to the Lord, but their hearts didn't love the Lord. Their hearts just wanted the Lord for what he could give them. They wanted victory. They wanted food. They were, they were just like all the pagans around them. The pagans would turn to their God. You need crops, you go to the fertility God. You need victory in war, you go to the war God. Whatever you needed, there was a God for that. And the Israelites begin treating their God just like all the other gods. We, when we need you, we come to you, but we don't actually love you. One commentator I read this week said this, All too often, however... The sole purpose of recognizing God was to derive benefits such as victory in war and provision of food. But isn't that how many of us still operate today? We come to God when we have a need, and as soon as the need is filled, we go right back to the way we were. A man loses his job. He perceives a need. He pleads with the Lord for a new job. The Lord provides him with that new job, and then he forgets the Lord just as, just as easily as he had remembered him. A man or a person is diagnosed with cancer. All of a sudden, they have a need for the Lord. They're excited. They become a person of prayer. The cancer goes away, and they are healed or whatever it is, and they go right back to all the spiritual laziness they had before. Or there's a relationship problem. Maybe you had a breakup. Maybe you would like to be in a relationship with someone. So you, you pray, and then as soon as the pain fades, as soon as you have what you wanted, then you go right back to the way it was before. 
or you want to pass a test. And so you pray, you pass the test, but you don't even go back to thank the Lord for answering your prayer. You just used him. That's what the Israelites did. They just used God again and again and again. That's how it was with Israel. They needed food, they got manna. They needed drink, they got water. They needed meat, they got meat. They needed victory, they got victory. And then again and again and again, when they had gotten what they wanted, then they forgot the one who had given them what they had asked for. They forgot. The psalmist would have us remember, not fail in the way that they had failed. And we had better remember because we have received far more from God than Israel had ever dreamed of receiving. Jesus is a better Savior who gives a better salvation. In fact, Jesus defines himself in these ways. He defines himself as offering a salvation, as being a greater gift than the water from the rock or the manna or the quail or even greater than God's provision of a righteous king in David. You you see this especially in the Gospel of John. Jesus says that he, is, that he is more worthwhile, that he is greater than the water that came from the rock that, that quenched the thirst of thousands of Israelites who would otherwise have died of thirst. We read this. Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said to the Samaritan woman at the well before that, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The Israelites were thirsty again. In fact, they died at some point. They they ceased even having water within them. But he says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Israel ate the bread. They ate the bread from heaven. They ate the manna, but then they died. And Jesus says this, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And David was the first of the shepherd kings. But Jesus defines himself even as a better shepherd than David. He says again from John, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Everything Israel had, bread and drink and king, we have in full in Christ, who is the giver of the living water, who is himself the bread from heaven, and who is the good shepherd and the great king, as remembered just this week with Ascension Day. Christ is all of those things. And Israel was commanded to remember what God had given them, and we have received even more than what they had received. We have every reason to remember, and we should never dare to make the same mistake that they made and squander what has been given to us. I mentioned a few weeks back I think I mentioned anyways, that I had been reading through some materials on the French Huguenots, French uh, Reformed Christians in the time of the Reformation, and the the Huguenots were persecuted terribly, terribly persecuted. And they were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and the French Catholic government, and sometimes one was more vicious than the other, but they were persecuted. And to escape this persecution, many left for Switzerland, a lot left for the Netherlands, others left for England and on and on, but many were forced to stay behind. 
In order to worship, they had to go at night into old abandoned snow-filled quarries to meet with a pastor who would go from place to place to place, walking all night in, in back little hunting trails to meet the next flock. And they would always go knowing that the dragoons, the soldiers, might be there to kill them, arrest and hang their pastor, and send the women off to nunneries and the men off to the galleys. And they did all of this because they held fast to the gospel. They would not not forget who Christ was and what he had done. And they would not, even on pain of death, they would not recant that everything they needed for salvation was already found in Christ. They didn't need a priest. They didn't need any kind of extra sacrifice. Everything they needed, they had already found in Christ. I thought, what, what an example of incredible faith of these people. And so and so moved by this faith as I read this and just thought, you know, we have a hard time sometimes convincing people that they should be in church and not at the soccer game on Sunday. These people are risking their lives to worship. I thought, well, what kind of legacy must they have left behind? So I just did a quick Google search, and I, I, I typed in Huguenot Church, and I was excited to see that there was a Huguenot Church in France. And what I found was that the Huguenot Church in France was entirely devoid of the gospel. It was at the forefront we call, might call liberalism, rebellion against God in the land of France, embracing all the values of the world, perhaps even in greater measure than the world has embraced them. Whereas the Huguenots would not give even an inch to the Roman Catholic Church, in that day they folded like a house of cards in the presence of a new enemy, secularization, in our own day. Somewhere along the line, they forgot. And they failed to remember. And those who are there now who fail to preach the gospel of Christ will themselves, as the Israelites did so many times, will themselves face the judgment of the great shepherd king on the day when he comes again. Those who forget history, are doomed to repeat it. And that was Israel's story. But it doesn't need to be our story. We have opportunities to remind ourselves and to be reminded of what God has done for us in Christ. And we should take all of these opportunities and we should place our children in these opportunities so that they can be reminded, so that one day they might remind their children of what God has done, that we can leave a generational legacy of remembrance by the power of the Holy Spirit of what Christ has done for us. And so we we need to take these opportunities and we need to to avail ourselves of these things. And, And even when we don't feel our need, even when we haven't been diagnosed with cancer, even when we aren't afraid, even when our marriages are strong and we're not feeling like we're pulling apart at the seams, even when we have a job, all of this stuff, even when we don't feel this particular need, even then we need to remind ourselves lest we forget and be destroyed. And we have so many opportunities for remembrance. We need to read the scriptures that speak to us of Christ and what he has done. We need to hear the scriptures preached as they preach the Bible, which speaks to us of Christ and what he has done. We need to sing the scriptures as we sing to ourselves, to others, about what Christ has done. We need to teach our children. We need to send them to Sunday school. We need to work in our Sunday schools. We need to send them to catechisms or whatever else it is that we can be instructed day by day, week by week, year by year, and reminded again and again and again and again of what God has done for us in Christ. We need to we need to be discipled and we need to disciple others. We need to discipline ourselves to walk in the way of Christ, lest we forget. And find ourselves, as Israel did so often, under the judgment of God. And the psalm ends with God's shepherd king on God's throne, 
in God's presence. And the world ends with God's good shepherd king on heaven's throne, ready to judge the nations and give full final salvation to those who remember and those who believe and those who have never forgotten what he has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, on this weekend that we set apart for remembrance, we ask that you would help us to remember the sacrifices of those who've gone before in many ways in our own country and across the course of the history of the church who have handed down the gospel to us. But as well, we, we ask even more than that, that we would remember Christ, the bread from heaven, the one who gives living water, the good shepherd, the king of kings, that we would remember him and never forget. And so on that last day, we might stand before him and be welcomed into the fullness of the kingdom, not be placed under your judgment. Help us to always remember and never forget. Amen.